drive up that mountain road and you see all the factories, the windmills on the skyline, everything is down to the one man. He's involved in cement property, glass bottling. He's involved in hotels, pubs. We're just making an arm for some money. When the director's making 200 million pounds a year of profit. He was on the Forbes list of billionaires. And then you just start thinking about how can the money make money? He learns about a contract for difference. It's a very complex financial instrument. It's a crude form of speculative gambling. But Sean Quinn loved it. He effectively took everything and invested it all into a bet on Angora's bank. Sean Quinn, the border billionaire, has quietly been amassing a significant stake in the Anglo-Irish Bank. Nobody is quite sure the amount. There was rumours of 3%, of Decision you took, the point that you look back with fondest memory in, in your life. You're talking about business. Business. Not, uh, not family, family, not family. Business. The sleeve rustling would come close. To have the sleeve rustle to go to was just unbelievable. My mother was approaching her 80s, I suppose, at that stage, and she, she regarded it as her achievement too, I mean, she had her friends bring her up there on a Sunday afternoon and she'd sit in the fire of the sleeve rustle and she'd watch the people coming and going. Investment in the sleeve rustle by Sean Quinn and its financing by Anglo Irish Bank is a very good example of that risk taking. It was regarded as a white elephant, like a five star hotel in a border county in really a, an area that you wouldn't think would sustain a five star hotel. I was teaching the local school in Derry Lynn and I would have pupils who weren't uh, very academic coming to me and saying, oh sure, we'll get a job with your brother anyway. You know, there was always, as he became more successful, there was always this ambition. And I think if I remember rightly, the geography teachers would have done surveys over time, you know, about um, how many of the pupils in the school had parents or siblings working in Quinn. And that was between 80 and 90% generally. Some people here tonight who haven't been in Cavan before. Stand up the Manchester gang, where are they? Stand up and give them a big warm welcome. And what about the Enniskillen gang? Stand up the Enniskillen gang. <laughs> Stand up the dubs. <laughs> and what about the Cavan crowd? Stand up the Cavan crowd. <laughs> It was a true point of pride for Sean Quinn that he could find and hire these guys. You know, the, the chief financial officer later of the Quinn Group came from Beltorbis, you know. Um, Liam McCaffrey, who ran Quinn Group, was another local guy. Kevin Dunne had worked as an accountant in a, in, a, in a large accountancy firm and probably thought there will never be a job that will interest me on, on that scale back, back in the area where I came from in Fermanagh. And Sean Quinn actually found a number of these these guys, Kevin Lunny was, was one of the first to come in as a kind of really, real lieutenant, right-hand man. The chairman of Quinn Direct. You know, was his biggest supporter, his biggest, you know, he would have said himself that he sort of learned at the knee of, of Sean Quinn. I'd like to make a presentation to somebody that had a major influence on the success of Quinn Direct over the past 10 years. He brought it to a level where it's one of the top ten companies in the country at the present time. And the one man that stood up, put a shoulder to the wheel at all times during that period and grew Quinn Direct, tremendous respect. I know, I know you all know who I'm talking about, so there's no big build-up to it, but there is a build-up to the fact of how we got there. And that is that 
somebody has to have the respect of their colleagues. And that's the important thing in life. Kevin Lunny always had the respect of his colleagues. <laughs> Kevin Lunny and Ian McCarthy were good friends of mine, and I, I promoted both of them to very senior positions. I had great respect for them, but I mean, you just can't go back to that. I just don't think they're worthy of much discussion, you know. There were 12 people started in the office in Quinn Direct 10 years ago. There's 1,100 of you here tonight. It's a hell of a story in business. I went up to the manufacturing plant at one stage, and there was a guy who was working in the cement factory for 30 years or whatever it was. And I kind of thought he'd be, you know, mourning the old days. And I said, well, what, what was it like? And he said, it was an effing nightmare because, and only because, he said he'd be standing where you were standing telling me how to do my job. He said he was absolutely hands-on in all aspects of whether it was cement, you heard the same story from the insurance company, the same story from glass, and certainly no reason not to believe the same story with the CFT investments. CFT is a bet on a share price effectively betting that their share prices would rise, and Sean Quinn invested everything that had been generated into a bet on Anglo-Irish Bank. Only the sort of core group of Sean Quinn, um, Kevin Lunny and Dara O'Reilly and Liam McCaffrey, I think had the full picture of what was being invested and where. Other people in the office would have known we shouldn't have been doing it. I suppose it, it just, it just has sort of happened, and again, maybe our, um, our system was a bit weak and maybe we didn't have enough uh, people just looking over this thing, and maybe I was too dominant a factor in this, and I suppose when I asked it to be done, it was done. When it ultimately came to, to light and when it ultimately came to, it became public, it was over 25% of Anglo-Irish Bank that was being held in the CFD products by Sean Quinn, the equivalent of, of more than a quarter of the shareholding of the bank. To put that in perspective, if he had owned 29.9% of the bank, he would have had to make a bid to buy the bank outright. About that meeting in the Ard Boyne Hotel, David Drum and Sean Fitzpatrick say, what's your plan? Are you making a play? He says, no, no, I'm not making a play. I believe in the bank, very impressed with what you've done. I'm just a passive shareholder. I don't know if the word shocked right, but uh, they were surprised. They did say, look at Sean, we're disappointed at the, le at, the, at the level of your CFDs, and could we uh, get some agreement that you might dispose of those? And I said, surely, if you want me to dispose of those uh, whenever the share recovers, I'd be more than happy to, to do that. And they seemed happy with that. And at the time, at the time, they seemed genuine in the fact that they, f that they felt the company would, would grow again and that the share price would recover. I don't think they were telling me lies. I think they did believe it. Diamonds. I think there was a feeling from Sean Quinn that they would be pleased that he was investing and supporting the bank and supporting its share price. Oh, it's OK, Sean Quinn, one of the biggest employers in the country with this amazing manufacturing business, is on our side. They immediately identified this as a massive problem. You going south? Yeah. Very Mexico way of China. But they had to keep him alive because if Sean Quinn wasn't alive, Anglo was dead. I probably shouldn't have uh, bought so many CFDs. I should have went and had a talk with them maybe six months or 12 months earlier before I bought so many CFDs. They also say, 
stop buying more. Don't increase it. This is a big, big play on the bank. So they go back, they report to the board, say, we've told them not to buy anymore. What does Sean Quinn do? He buys more. That was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. There's no, there was no excuse for that. It was stupid to increase it at all. I'd accept that. We shouldn't have bought any more shares. But we bought, we, we bought, we bought some more shares, but not very many. He really believed everything that had been said and told, you know, about Anglo-Irish Bank. So when the shares were falling, he thought, the shares are cheaper now. I'm going to buy some more. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist, but, you know, classic sort of gambler behavior that maybe we can recoup some of this. I was confident going home that, yes, this bank's going to be successful and this share is going to recover. In the early stages of 2008, there was this kind of frenzy in the global financial markets. See? Song, proud and strong. Banks were scrambling to get money together, so investors were looking at, well, which are the most vulnerable financial institutions? And on St. Patrick's Day, the market starts turning its attention to Ireland. There is a fundamental weakness in the Irish banking sector, and that's its overexposure to the property I market. do not accept that at all. The Irish banks are so well capitalised compared to any banks anywhere across Europe that I am confident that they can absorb any loans or any impairments that emerge in the order. The strategy of that time from Patrick Neary and from the government was light touch. We, they wanted finance to thrive. They wanted banks out there doing deals. They didn't want to look under the bonnet and find out what was really going on. I believe the Irish banks are adequately, more than adequately capitalised and they're very resilient. Sean Fitzpatrick and David Drum, their view was, we can fix this. And so one of the first things that they did was, is like, we need to sell a financial regulator because Sean Quinn is regulated through his insurance company. The regulator needs to know. David Drum and Anglo-Irish Bank were surprised at the reaction they got from the regulator. Pat Neary at the time dismissed it as a bet, uh, not something that really we need to worry too much about. He assumes because Sean Quinn is listed in the rich lists as one of Ireland's richest men, because he's ranked by Forbes as a billionaire, that he can afford this. In reality, of all the people in Ireland who knew that he couldn't, it should have been Patrick Neary. Welcome to a special St. Patrick's Day 6-1 News and Sport. The Irish market was down with bank shares worst hit. St. Patrick's Day massacre, as it's called, and share prices of banks all over the world tanked. Anglo was in the crosshairs and the investors turned on Anglo-Irish Bank. What we didn't know at the time publicly was how deep in the hole Sean Quinn was or how deep in the hole Anglo was. That all had yet to play out, um, but definitely that was the point of no return. children have been very good to us. Hopefully they would say that we have been good to them, but we get on well, we have plenty of rows, and I suppose they thought they were multi-millionaires, uh, if not more, and then the father give it all away on them. I was ambitious and I was hungry, and I liked to be successful, and of course everybody likes winning. Maybe we were growing too fast and uh, maybe taking too much risks as it turned out. 
and maybe I was too close to the decision making at all times. The issue with CFD investment policy John Quinn was using was as the share price goes down, you have to put up money to cover your losses. The brokers who had sold Sean Quinn's CFDs then began to make what's called margin calls. I didn't consider myself a risk taker, and I, I think risk takers are people that borrow money to an excessive level. Over the previous 35, 36 years, you'd always get wee bits of shocks for a month or two and that. And you don't go to the pub and say, Jesus, I bought CFDs yesterday and are down 10% a day. You don't go broadcasting that. So it wasn't in the public knowledge. As the share price falls, there's an automatic call. It clocks up on somebody's screen. You need to get more money off this guy. A margin call is the amount that the share price has gone down. And because you haven't bought the share, you have to fund this every single day. To cover the losses that you've made, you need to provide us 50 million, 100 million, 200 million. Sean Quinn had money, yeah. He had lots of money. But you can only fund margin calls out of cash for so long. And within a couple of months, he was running shy of the reservoir of cash. One of the most striking figures for me in all of this, to meet the initial cash calls, Sean Quinn, the Quinn family, the Quinn group, put up 750 million euro of actual cash resources from the group to meet the initial calls. One of the most cash-rich reserves was the equity that he had in Quinn Insurance. Insurance companies are regulated and obliged to have certain amounts of equity and cash on their balance sheet. And so he saw opportunities to dip into that to cover some of those margin calls. But you can't do that in a regulated entity. You can't dip in to the money. And all this time, Sean Quinn felt that this will get better soon. He had dipped into the insurance company. He had used up whatever personal resources he could. But at this point, he has to go to Anglo-Irish Bank and ask them for money. And the bank doesn't have a choice. They recognised that there was a major problem here, and the only way to deal with it was to lend more money to Sean Quinn and they took security in some of his properties. We've lost 60 million today. We've lost 20 million today. We've lost 100 million today. And day after day, Anglo-Irish Bank would have to give that money over. We're talking in the order of about 400 million over the course of March. Extraordinary sums of money having to be drawn to make these margin calls loans began to be made through various Quinn companies to Sean Quinn in a number that would eventually amount to 2.8 billion euro. Nobody knows this is going on. Most of the loans are simply dressed up as working capital for the Quinn group or property related lending. The structure of the Quinn group was that there would have been a very small group of people with awareness, you know, where money was being moved between companies. Kevin Lunny and Dara O'Reilly and Liam McCaffrey, um, they were, you know, getting calls on Saturdays and Sundays saying, we need another 200 million to cover. So there was definitely knowledge of, you know, not to understate it, a growing problem of hundreds of millions of euro that would ultimately become billions of euro. My sense is that the family wouldn't have, have known certainly the full extent of, of, of what was going on. The five children owned the Quinn Group. When those cash calls, those margin calls started to be made, definitely there were 
documents to be signed for loans from Anglo-Irish Bank to cover the margin calls. But, you know, you might have a 10 or 20 or 40 page loan document than that they only ever saw the, the signatory page and they signed their name. Not unusual in the way that Sean Quinn had always run his businesses. He was always the driver. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that Daddy didn't tell them the full implications of everything that was going on. But they're all free, white on 21, you know, they didn't come down the last shower of rain. And if they were signing documents, they knew there was something important. And they can't come back and complain afterwards that the bank didn't send somebody up to hold their hand and explain the fine print to them in the knowledge that they might decide not to sign. Now, what would Daddy have said then? I mean, it just doesn't hold up at all. You have very little sympathy for them? None. When you started to take money out of the insurance business in order to, to cover the CFDs, that was the risk that you took with that business? That was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. That was, I put my hands up completely on that. Did I think it'd be over me for maybe two, three, four weeks, maybe all passed over? Uh, that's the way it was, but there was no, there was no, there was no excuse. It shouldn't, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have touched a penny in a regulated entity. I shouldn't have done that. Yet another torrid day's trading for financial stocks. Anglo-Irish Bank plunged 5% to close at €7.13. During that period, the bank was working on possibilities to try and unwind, as they say, John Quinn's position, to get an investor in to buy some of the shares. And so they had to really take measures into their own hands and come up with their own Anglo-type solution. So they rounded up what's now known as the Maple 10. We can lend money to them to take part of Sean Quinn's interest in the bank. It's 10% for the Maple 10, it's 15% for Sean Quinn. And then Sean Quinn agreed to transfer the remaining 15% into an actual physical holding in the bank, something that would have to be announced to the market. It is portrayed as this great news story, this meeting of minds of this great industrialist and this buccaneering bank, and together they're going to do great things. In reality, of course, it's, it's a nonsense. And gamble. Does that make any sense? Procter's trading at 16. Now, what the heck is going on down here? The trouble is, the news just keeps on getting worse and worse. Lehman Brothers, a 158-year-old firm, filed for bankruptcy. The collapse of Lehman Brothers triggered turmoil in markets around the globe. Stocks tumbled in Taiwan and India, then plummeted in Europe by nearly 5%. What we've seen over the last 24 hours is an earthquake which we've been waiting uh, and expecting for some while. Do you think there's going to be very many? I think it's going to be all of us. It sent the financial markets across the world into a tailspin. And a lot of focus was on Anglo-Irish Bank, not so much because it's funding issues, but because there were questions now around just how heavily they had lent into the property market. Many international investors who had huge deposits with the Irish banks began to withdraw very large sums of money. At 4 a.m. this morning, senior bankers, regulators and the government hammered out the final details of a deal. The chairman of Anglo-Irish Bank admitted his bank had made mistakes in the past, but had not been reckless. Banks should pay for it, but they shouldn't be crippled in what they're asked to pay either. The regulator has required Quinn Insurance to pay 3.2 million euro, the biggest penalty of its kind. Mr. Quinn is to pay 200,000 euro. Mr. Quinn is standing down as chairman and director of Quinn Insurance, but will remain as chairman of the Quinn Group. There was a realization at a meeting in November 2008 in Buzzwells that Sean Quinn had made a mistake. And it was the last time he met David Drum. And it was kind of like a no hard feelings type meeting. Sean Quinn probably deep down realized at that point that he was in a deeply precarious position. 
Today, the Anglo-Irish Bank has announced it had set aside half a billion euro for future bad debts. It makes sense to just be prudent, and it is an ultra-prudent move, really, to put aside. It's an old um, concept of rainy day money, if you like, to put aside a provision um, to provide for potential um, future losses uh, coming out of, of a recessionary period. It was just the whole banking world collapsed. But there we go. I made an awful lot of good decisions in my 40 odd years in business, but uh, that, was, that, that was one bad one and one fatal one. Tonight, the bank issued a statement saying Sean Fitzpatrick and another director had tendered their resignations. The state's looking at this basket case of a bank and saying, what are we going to do with it? So in January 2009, it was announced the government was nationalising Anglo. Within the past hour, the government has announced that Anglo-Irish Bank is to be nationalised. The minister, Brian Lenehan, said it would be taken into full public ownership. He said unacceptable practices within the bank had caused it serious damage. I am angry because the people who really were the watchdogs let us down. The people responsible for us have just resigned and walked away. I think heads should roll. You know, it's disgraceful what's happened. It's about time that this government stopped dancing to the tune uh, of developers and big bankers. It seems to me that this government is soft on corporate crime. Everybody knows that Anglo was at the heart of the banking crisis. People are looking for hope and they're looking for leadership. As a result of the due diligence process recently undertaken on behalf of the minister, certain matters in connection with transactions involving the Queen's stake in the bank came to the attention of the minister, which may warrant further investigation by the financial regulator. The shares of Anglo would no longer be on the stock exchange. They would be worthless. And sitting up in Cavan is Sean Quinn, nursing one of the biggest financial losses in Irish history. You're welcome to Derry Lynn, Tommy. Uh, I'm glad to get the opportunity to discuss some of the st stuff you want to talk to me about. And I suppose Anglo seems to be the one that. It's the centre of attraction. The Queen was quite open at the time, said, yeah, it's a bit of a blow, but we'll deal with it. We've seen this figure of a billion plus 1.5 billion. Is it near that? Yes. More than a billion? <laughs> more than a billion, yeah. Less than two billion? <laughs> it's more than a billion. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not getting into that. It's, it's substantial money. But, I mean, our company makes four or five hundred million profits per year. What nobody realised is that he was in for more than two billion on the bank and he hadn't got the money to cover that. We can survive without the Anglo shares. We've written it off, and we're not discussing as regards as the, as the family, as the, as the five kids and the wife that owns the shares in Anglo-Irish Bank. So we're not discussing what their losses are, but they're substantial. Sean Quinn didn't bring down Anglo-Irish Bank. Anglo-Irish Bank was doomed to fail. You know, it was, it was, it was a Ponzi scheme. It was going to collapse. Um, however, Sean Quinn's not blameless either. <laughs> How do you come to lose a billion plus? Well, I suppose you could ask the question, how do you come to make a billion plus? And I suppose the other thing is it's a family investment. It's not just my investment. And I'm not trying to push, I'm not trying to push the blame off to anybody else. But the shares are owned by my kids. And the, the, the kids bought the, the shares. He's not the only businessman who gambled. A lot of the major property developers gambled, but there's a difference between that kind of gambling, which is gambling on your judgment of what's going to happen to the market, and gambling on contracts for difference when the share that you're gambling on is tanking, when you continue gambling in it. It's a mentality that I think is ultimately self-destructive. This gamble on, on Anglo through CFTs had just gone spectacularly, like incredibly wrong. The family owed 2.8 billion, but they now owed it to the state. The real 
one question that people have is what are you going to do about it? I think at this stage everybody understands the gravity of the situation, the gravity of the government's finances. The Irish people, if we can work together as a team, we can ensure that we have a prosperous future for ourselves and our children and future generations. When the government nationalised and took controlling stakes of all of the banks, they wanted to put their own people on the boards. Alan Dukes, a former Fine Gael leader and a former Minister for Finance, was appointed to the board of Anglo-Irish Bank. At the time, people went in and said, look, we'll put him in there, Alan will go in, he'll report back, we'll fix it. Nobody realised how bad it was going to be or that Alan Dukes would literally be involved in litigation all over the world within a couple of years. ...which they have currently reached. Anglo-Irish Bank had become public enemy number one. Our job, basically, was to see what could be rescued from the wreckage of what went before uh, and to do it as efficiently as we could. Uh, on the basis of what we know, uh, we think in the bank that a figure in the order of 25 billion. And I wrote a letter and I said, look at selling the business, selling any part of the business would be a mistake. It's very closely managed, it's micromanaged, it's running very well. It just didn't make any sense. One of the things um, that, that we made sure we kept under the spotlight of the board was the situation of the largest borrowers from the bank. And, you know, Sean Quinn was one of the big ones. Any he had done for the previous 35, 40 years, I suppose, turned out to be successful. And any wee hippics we had were always ironed out over a six, 12 month period. And I, I, I didn't see it any different than that. I didn't see this crash. Uh, of 2007, 2009, I didn't see it any different, you know. After the management of Anglo, Sean Fitzpatrick and David Drum had been cleared out. You have a message for the taxpayers, Mr. Drum. They needed to bring in bankers to run it. Mike Gainsley, he was Australian, he was tough, and he had done this sort of work in Australia and Japan and around the world. And he came in as the new chief executive of Anglo-Irish Bank. He needed people who he trusted, and that means he brought in people who he knew. So he brought in Richard Woodhouse. Richard Woodhouse, he, he's a very British chap, um, but very, very able and very capable. The first time Richard Woodhouse goes up to Cavan, sits down with Sean Quinn in the staff canteen, it's all fine. They shake hands, they have a spot of tea, they have a sandwich. I said, what we can do is, we'll pay you back this money reasonably quickly. We'll have it all paid back in less than 10 years. Sure, everybody knows the Quinn Group's a huge success story. And they agree, oh, it'd be great, we'll work together, we'll sort all of this out. Oh, he wanted to do a deal, but he wanted to do it on his terms. Uh, and he wanted to do it on the basis of a financial plan that said, if we would just lend a further 600 million euro, with him still in control, uh, that the companies would work themselves out of the problem. And for obvious reasons, for a man who's gambled three billion euro of his own money, and which ultimately became Anglo-Irish Bank's money because of its lending to him, they weren't going to do that. We genuinely felt we were so strong, so we were just making an arm for some money. It seemed to think that Sean Quinn felt that if it wasn't him was doing this, it couldn't be done right. And to give that impression that he felt that he was invincible, he was the only man who could run any of this show. So that wasn't true, I mean, but... They weren't very impressed with my attitude. I certainly wasn't overly impressed with their attitude. So we didn't gel that well together. This was a person who had achieved some very significant things. Uh, but there was a piece of him that just didn't understand the ramifications of, of what he had done. It never occurred to us that anybody, wrongly, it never occurred to us that anybody was going to take this draconian action to try to break up the Quinn group, take it away and destroy it and take it out of my control. 2009, the financial regulator had become increasingly worried about Quinn insurance. They were worried about the company's reserving policies, how much it was putting aside for claims. But they were also very worried that assets that sat on the Quint balance sheet of Quinn Insurance 
had been pledged to the Queen Group so that they could in turn be pledged to Anglo-Irish Bank because Anglo needed security for all the money it was handing over. We were saying, look at Cheryl, there is no guarantees given. The guarantees are not given. Then some Liam McCaffrey or something, there is guarantees given. Who gives them? Yourself and Kevin is only given. Pooh. How does that happen? Mistake. We know that it was illegal, it can't be given. A guarantee can't be given on a regular country. I said, yeah, we'll have to check that out, we'll have to check that out, blah, blah, blah. So he says, what if we have to make an urgent claim? Quinn direct. Sean Quinn has a different view, but certainly the actuaries, the government, the central bank and the joint administrators have all come to a very singular view that the company was chronically under-reserving. And as a result, was throwing off massive profits. But those profits weren't real. In 2008, at the height of the crash and at the height of the share dealings in Anglo, we had 580 million of cash and reserves in, in, in Quinn the Wreck. Two years later, we had 1.1 billion of cash reserves. We're joined on the line now by Sean Quinn. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Richard. Uh, you have a couple of points of clarification about this deal. We were just getting some sketchy reports earlier on. What can you tell us about it? Well, I'm not sure where some of the figures here are coming from. I don't, I don't know what is... We, the, the Quinn Group has plenty of money. We don't need money. It's very cash-rich, and we don't need extra money, but the, the regulator feels he needs an extra $100 million of solvency. But, um, I mean, what is the risk then to the, to the, to the taxpayer, uh, Sean Quinn, if you can still hear me, what exactly is the risk to the Irish taxpayer of this proposed deal that we're hearing about? He's gone, I'm afraid. Uh, Sean Quinn is gone. All the financial regulator wanted was for Quinn to put his hand in his pocket and to put two or three hundred million euro into Quinn Insurance to shore up its solvency requirements. Repeatedly, they were told it was on the way. The money never arrived. In old Ireland, it would have all been fine. But at this time, new regulators come in to the financial regulator. Both financial firms and those that lead them need to be held much more accountable for their actions than has happened in the past and be subject to tougher sanctions. Matthew Elderfield arrives from the Bahamas with his own team. He goes to the various divisions and he says, Right, any problems I need to know about? And one name keeps on coming up, John Quinn. High impact firms and those with a poor track record should not expect to receive the benefit of doubt. So we will be prepared to substitute our prudential judgment for their commercial one and say, just do it. The regulator came to the conclusion that um, Quinn Insurance was not being properly managed. Sean Quinn had to be taken out. The High Court has appointed two provisional administrators to the Quinn Insurance Group. The order was made what's following going on? It's a big story, isn't it? I mean, effectively, what we're seeing here is that the financial regulator has smelt a rat at Quinn, and it's, it seems to be a pretty big one. And the decision so to put the company into administration was like a bolt from the blue. My husband and I have both worked here for over six years. We have a small family, and we rely on our jobs in this area. There's no prospect of any jobs like the ones we have at the minute. We need to pay our bills. The regulator had thought that Quinn had a 200 million euro cushion, but after this investigation, it's now decided that Quinn is actually in the red to the same amount, 200 million euro. Whatever happens, it is a major collateral damage to me, to my family, to the area, to Quinn Direct and to his employees. It's a major, major collateral damage and absolutely no need for it. As soon as they put in the administrator and we were using Quinn Direct, that did leave the Quinn Group in trouble because Quinn Direct was the biggest single contributor to the profitability of it. The administration of Quinn Insurance affected the resources of the rest of the Quinn Group um, and therefore affected the capacity the bank had uh, to make sure it got repaid what it was owned from the rest of the Quinn Group. So the, the two things, you know, were indissolubly linked. When you take a brick out of the wall, the, the wall becomes very unstable. And 
they took wind insurance from underneath them. There's this assumption that Quinn will buy his way out of trouble. Everyone thought Sean Quinn is going to regain control of the company, until he didn't. He had his opportunity to go into court and to try and seek the removal of their joint administrators. He didn't. He had the option to put his hand in his pocket and write a check for a couple of hundred million euro to shore it up. He didn't. So gradually then people began to realize that Sean Quinn didn't have as much money as one assumed he had. They owe a lot of money. Um, the Quinn family owes us 2.88 billion. And as you say, by extension, the Irish taxpayer. But the Quinn group itself also owes roughly 1.3 billion to a group of lenders and bondholders. So combined, it's an enormous amount of debt. He proved to be absolutely opposed to any kind of restructuring that didn't have him at the centre of it. So it came to the point where uh, we just took the view that he couldn't be involved. The reason for the meeting on the 14th of April was to talk to Sean Quinn about a last chance agreement we, we can make. We had put a proposal to him um, some time before that, which would have left him and his family uh, with a measure of provision, but it required him definitively to step away from connection with the company and just let the rest of us get on with it. No, you see, yeah. this is the peculiar part about the whole thing is they were saying that we, that, that we were negotiating that maybe get back Quinn direct. And Alan Dukes cost, uh, asked me when I go up to Dublin to meet him in, in the Anglo's office. Kevin Lunny and Dara O'Reilly came with me. Now, it turned out that that morning was a morning that supporters of the Quinn group, or Quinn Shin, the Quinn family, was going to Dublin to the government offices with 93,000 signatures of give this business back, to, give the insurance company back to Sean Quinn. 300 workers from the Quinn group handed in a letter to TDs calling for the reversal of the appointment of provisional administrators to Quinn Insurance. We had no expectation that he was going to agree with what we were going to do, but we felt we had to put the offer, put the suggestion to him, and it was agreed I would put the proposal to him uh, and we would see what his reaction would be. Duke said, look, we're taking over the, we're taking over the company. He's not a very demonstrative man, but he was obviously shocked. He didn't say a whole lot very quickly, but he, he, he then asked, what were the implications of this? Are we going to take all of the businesses? Are we going to take all of the units, all of the property assets? And to which the answer was yes. But it genuinely never dawned on us that they were going to take the Quinn Group. That never dawned on us. Never. That never, never crossed my mind. We thought it was going to be a good day for us. He, he said at the end, I, I can't agree to that. I don't agree to that. There's no point in going any further. And he got up and left. Duke said they were taking over the company. And there was people gone to Delhi Lynn this morning as we speak. There were people taking over Steve Russell and uh, Quinn Group and they're in their head office. And uh, you two men are gone along with Sean's gone and you two boys are gone as well. They're sacked. Everybody's gone. We're proud of Sean Quinn. Yeah. We will back him all the way. North, South, East and West will get behind Sean. He has employed so many people in this area in County Gavin. We, we are here to stand up for him and come him. David Quinn alone, let him sort out himself. Quinn has done more for Calvin, for Mana, Monaghan and Leitham than any other man in the country has done. The message we are sending out here this evening to all political parties in government is we will not stand idly by and let this happen as a community. And what did you do immediately after that? Man? There was a decision made there and then that we would try to secure the assets that they hadn't loaned money to. We didn't touch anything they had loaned money to. Now, it was a bad decision, but that's what we decided. It wasn't my idea 
to, to it, it wasn't that I wouldn't do it, I would do it, but I hadn't thought of moving the assets that, were, that, that they had in finance. Other people who were smarter than I, they had thought of it. And I said, that's a good idea. So I supported it, so I'm not trying to blame anybody. And if I'd thought of it myself, I'd probably have proposed it, you know. Uh, but people were on, uh, uh, were on the aeroplanes that evening, trying to agree individuals we could move to assets into different names to keep them safe. Did you remember the trip back home that evening? Yeah. We called for a steak maybe about the Arbine or somewhere uh, on the way home. You're welcome back to Morning Ireland. It's a quarter past seven. The people of Cavan and Fermanagh again rallied around the beleaguered Quinn family yesterday with another vocal show of support. And the man who was once the richest man in the country is fighting the successors of Anglo-Irish Bank and the courts over loans of nearly three billion euro. The administrators couldn't let the business continue. Now they're facing a huge number of compensation claims and payouts. It's and we're all facing paying a levy for most of our insurance Well, exactly, yeah, and, and it looks as if that's going to now cost uh, the Irish policyholders uh, in excess of w 1 billion euro. There is no power like the power of people that we have here tonight. The wealth was created by every single man, woman and child here today. It was created by the blood and the sweat. It's our heritage. It belongs to our children. My family was four decades in business. We built over 200 companies. We employed tens of thousands of people. And we will not be Anglo scapegoats. We believe that the Quinn family deserve our support. We've had a selective view of the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Quinn. It might be a wee bit emotional for me this evening, so I'm not going to say too much. Um... The specific hostility uh, from that community uh, in the border area, uh, to my mind, is completely misdirected. The person who nearly ruined their livelihoods is Sean Quinn. We will not be bullied or intimidated by Anglo. We will not go quietly into the night. Make no mistake about it, this is a war. And you can see how this story unfolds as Queen Country continues tomorrow night at 9.35. And you can catch up on this and episode one right now on the RTE player. Next tonight here on RTE One, prime time. <laughs>